Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Heal the Shadow in Your Relationships, too. And today, I am so honored and so privileged to have with us the legendary Barbara Marks Hubbard. Welcome, Barbara. So happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you. Barbara Marks Hubbard has been called the voice for conscious evolution of our time by Deepak Chopra and is the subject of Neil Donald Walsh's book, The Mother of Invention. She is a prolific author, a visionary, a social innovator, an educator. She founded the Foundation for Conscious Evolution and is the producer and narrator of the award-winning documentary series, Humanity Ascending, A New Way Through Together. In 2012, Barbara partnered with the Shift Network to co-produce the worldwide multimedia event, Birth 2012, co-creating a planetary shift in time, which was on December 22nd, 2012. She is a fellow of the Club of Budapest, is a member of many progressive organizations, including the Evolutionary Leaders Group, and the Transformational Leadership Council, and she co-founded the Association for Global New Thought and the World Future <laughs> Society. And, and Barbara, there is so much more to say about you, but that was a condensed version. So uh, again, I'm very, very pleased to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you. And we are talking about healing the shadow in our relationships. And I was so privileged to get to see you speak recently at Agape, and it was such a beautiful talk. I wanted to recap some of the things that we were talking about then that you were talking about. So um, to begin with, I wonder if you have a definition or a perspective on what is the shadow in our personal relationships or maybe even in a, in a, on a social or global scale. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the shadow all springs from one thing. It's the illusion of separateness that is basic to our consciousness. And sometimes when I try to think, what is, what is wrong with us? <laughs> How come we can be so cruel, be so, so thoughtless to one another? And I always come down to this one thing that there's an abnormal degree of sense of separation from nature, from each other, and from spirit. So the shadow gets in there every time. And the solution I have found to the shadow is to take, get my local self, my separated self, the reactive self, the egoic self, to relax, to become my own essential self, my own true nature, and bring the, essence, bring the local self in to get rid of the shadow in me, number one, not just in relationships, but my shadow would be the separated self criticizing or whatever one's own separated self. There's a set of wounds that almost everybody has. Yes. And mine is a compulsive working. All right, you haven't done enough. You haven't done enough. No matter, you know, it's like six in the morning, I haven't done enough. Oh. Well, that's, that's that local self. So then when I practice what I call emergence, the shift from ego to essence, and became truly grounded in my own essence as my true nature. I could handle my own separated selves. So they, they became, uh, what will they actually, it's the mother, father, God within. They want to be with you. They don't want that separation. It's like a child. They're very much like wounded children. Yes. So when that gets I wouldn't even say healed, but evolved so that you are your own essence, the shadow doesn't come in easily. Or if there is a shadow, you see it's your local self or somebody else's local self who has operated in a separated way that's hurtful and can be extremely hurtful. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I think the shadow gets in. Absolutely. And you said it so perfectly. It always comes from a sense of separation. I mean, that is the bottom line. Yes. I'm so curious, since you did confess that your shadow is compulsive overwork, is the intention to stop being that way? Or is the intention to just simply integrate it, allow it, accept it? How, how do you handle that part of yourself? <laughs> well, 
I, I spend more time being my own essence, which is at peace, at one source, creative source of universe incarnate as you and me. So when I am that, then I start, I would say, expressing so much more effectively whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's writing or speaking or cleaning the house, whatever it is, the local self relaxes. I got it. And what I also have learned that sometimes the local self has good advice. It's just that it gives it in a, in a hurtful way. <laughs> so I could say, yes, I understand. Maybe I haven't done this or that. And we're getting to it in fullness of time. So I talk to my local self and I'm in a, a, also a, a small group where we can share the stories of our own local selves. And we don't identify with them and we don't try to destroy them. Like there's some traditions trying to get rid of the yes. ego. It's, it's sometimes it's that you need it. Yes. It, it's, it's an executive director. Mm -hmm. it, if it's relaxed, mm -hmm. it, it can be good. So that, that's the bottom line right there. Let's just relax that local self. I, I call it the personality construct. Exactly. Let's just relax it. Let's become more of our authentic selves. So since we're talking about love relationships, I would love to hear your perspective on what is the future of our love relationships, the way that we are coupling on the planet. There seems to be so much divorce. You know, we, we don't know what's going on. Singles are finding it harder to get together. Oh, I have some wonderful ideas on that. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I think that... First of all, starting with the woman, whether it's a younger woman or a woman over 50, is that there is a basic biological change, bioevolutionary bio change, is that we can't have as many babies as we did before. Fewer and fewer children and living longer and longer lives. So what's happening, speaking for a moment for the women over 50, first of all, we're not dying. <laughs> And we're yes. getting more creative and beautiful yes. and fulfilled and, and, and really dynamic. So there is a shift, I think, from maximum procreation toward co-creation, from self-reproducing and nurturing all those children to self-evolving. And so when the feminine starts to self-evolve, she gives birth to the authentic feminine self, the creative self that's feminine, that pulls on the great power of the universe itself within her. And as she does that, she becomes um, animated and enters what I call regenopause. <laughs> I it's, love it. It's I'm, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Over 50, regenopause is a pause in the life cycle of the woman. And instead of, because our sisters have done so well in making us equal in this culture, not not totally equal, but enough. Yeah. So we're not under the we're not forced into the old roles anymore. We're not forced. We're free. That the, the woman who is going through that wants to become co-creative and help. She's operating out of love, not fear or anger. Mm -hmm. And she's giving birth to an authentic feminine expression of her unique self in the world in such a way that she becomes extremely viable and creative and beautiful and even regenerating because I'm 85. And bless I'm, you. Bless you, Barbara. I mean, it's actually funny because I'm feeling newer every day. Wow. And you know how you get to feel newer? New, new whole systems are made up of separate parts connecting as within a whole, single cells, multi cells, all the way on up. So when I connect my separated local self with my essential self, with the highest frequencies of my being, with my love of the Christ, the whole thing, and I bring it all in into a whole, I become new because I've become whole. And every one of us has many parts to our being. So what's happening here with the, with the woman is she's becoming a whole, an authentic feminine self, and a, a creative necessity in the world with fewer and fewer children. Same of younger women. They don't intend to have maximum numbers of babies. I had five children. No, I mean, people in our culture, very, very few want to do that. 
So it's birth by choice. And I think we're also heading into life extension. Yes. yes. So it's going to be life extension and also probably in the end death by choice. Wow. A conscious dying. I think conscious dying is as important as conscious birthing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know there is a wonderful movement around that already and so many people working through hospice and things like that. Exactly. And, and so then the relationship of the feminine co-creator is she's, she's seeking to join genius, mm. not genes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Joining genes, you have the baby. Yes. Joining genius, if you can find compatible others, whether they be a male or female, doesn't matter. But if, it's a, if you're a woman and it's a man and you are joining genius with a man who is also coming from his essential self rather than from the old separated dominator model, then you get a love affair. Yes. Well, the highest order of genius joining. I, I love that. And since we talked so much about how women's roles are changing, and, and let me just ask you a quick question. You said this is biological, that biologically women are actually changing to not have as many children before? No, what I meant to say was there's a bioevolutionary reality on planet Earth. I see. If we're, we're over 7 billion people, or almost 8, and we're, we're hitting the carrying capacity of Earth. So therefore, the feminine is going to have fewer children, one yes. way or the other. And particularly in our culture, when we are free and we know all this and we have birth control, we are having fewer children, only chosen children. Most sexual intercourse is not to have babies. Right. And right. so the sperm is always hitting some barrier. Yes. <laughs> what about the flight of the lonely sperm? <laughs> Well, well let can't get to the egg anymore. <laughs> so so let's talk about the evolution of men in this world since we know where where women are heading heading to co-create with other partners and regenerate themselves. Where's the lonely sperm and the lonely man in all this? <laughs> well, I think when the man also becomes a co-creator, he then tunes into his own essence. And it's harder for a man than a woman because there are more social structures of what success looks like for the men. So, but if a man has the ability, let's say like Stephen Dynan, who is a CEO of the Shift Network that I, I'm doing a lot of teaching on. Yes. Now, he is a very good CEO. He has to run that company. But he is so attuned that when he becomes a dominator, he stops himself. Mm. And he goes into his own essence and the feeling of compassion and love comes out of him because he's self-evolving. Mm. And I'm very, you know, very admiring of the men who are becoming masculine co-creators. And they are going through, Neil Donald Walsh said, well, if the woman goes through regenopause, what happens to the man? And he said it's andropause. Yeah. So andropause is the man at some point in his life cycle is no longer the dominator, mm. is tuning into his own essence and finding his unique expression as a unique self in the world. Mm. And that unique self is, is coded, as Mark Gaffney says, with an irreducibly unique aspect of the process of creation as you. Yes. <laughs> so, so this is so beautiful, and I love this vision and of course, we live in a world where the internet has changed our relationships too. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about the significance of the internet for our era here today. Well, I think the, the internet is our nervous system of the planetary body. <laughs> and that nervous system is still a little chaotic because we are. Yes. And, but it's amazing that we have Google with every, all the wisdom of the world in the palm of your hand in your smartphone. That's phenomenal. It the is. fact that we're over 7 billion phones, we can talk to each other anywhere, anytime. Mark Zuckerberg said he's going to make sure that everybody on earth can be online. Everybody. <laughs> now, what's happening here? We're becoming a living system. The noosphere, thinking layer of Earth, the global brain, the, the internet, the cyberspace is, is actually a connecting fiber 
bringing humanity to be, to be born as a whole being. That's what I think. Mm. I think we're being born as a new species. Wow. I call it a universal human, a unique self, a co-creator who's one with the process of creation and has to love the earth, free the people, and explore the vast reaches of inner space and the universe. That, that is huge. <laughs> but it's really a crisis of birth of a new humanity. And well, we're, we're yeah. living right through it. Yeah, no wonder we're all so confused. The, the confusion comes in from hanging on to the old way that we've been doing things. And if we let that go and allow ourselves to go with this new direction, right? That, but you know, I know that not everybody is is understanding or knowing what their next step is to look like. Well, that's right. So the way you find out, okay, is, <laughs> great. You tune in and see what is your greatest, deepest life purpose and passion to create. What does your unique self long to express? Like, I'm sure that what you're doing is somehow a calling of your soul. Absolutely, yeah. So you're already finding that out. Yeah. Because your soul said, and you said yes to that. Then you have to take a lot of steps to get things done in this world. Yes. I, 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 got, I said yes to being a communicator of evolutionary potential. Mm. When I said yes, way back, that I was the mother of five, and I basically was told, go tell the story of the birth of a universal co-creative humanity. Wow. So it wasn't easy. I had to go tell my husband, <laughs> <laughs> my children, your mother, your wife is going forth to tell the story of the birth of a universal humanity. Well, was that popular? <laughs> You, you paved the way. I did. And then I said to my children, well, oh, my, my little nine-year-old son said, well, mom, you're doing what mothers are supposed to do. You're creating a future for your children. Oh, I know you love us and I'll come with you. <laughs> that is the best gift a child can give their mother, isn't it? That's beautiful. And it's the best gift I find also that the mother can give the child is their, her love and then her sense of life purpose because she's modeling to the children that her life purpose is giving greater excitement and joy to her life. They have a, they, children learn by modeling. So beautiful, so beautiful. So, so when, when you're talking about purpose, I can't help but think of the shadow since that's my topic. And I've heard it said that what we hold in the shadow, that part of us that we can't see, that we're afraid to let out, that those, those unwanted emotions that we can't feel, if we get in touch with that, it becomes our greatest power. It becomes our greatest gift in life. Do you yeah. have anything to say about that? Well, I, I think that's true. If you are able to examine deeply that separated self, that is reactive and angry. What you, in order to do it, you have to become your own essence. Yes. You have to incarnate the divine as you. Now, when you do that, you can actually be seeing that whatever the shadow, so called, is the shadow caused by the separation. You see, if there's no separation, there's no shadow. That's really graphically true, even with light. Yes. I mean, I get a shadow because my hands are separate. Right. When I'm like this, they're not separate. Yes. So I guess that, that, that the shadow, by revealing to the essence, this part of me that is not fully mature, that's part that's hurt, and when I heal that by bringing it in, I actually grow yes. so much. So if I don't notice all this out here, all these local cells, then I don't fulfill my complete destiny. Yes. So, so when I heard you speak at Agape, you were talking about how we can participate in the evolution of love relationships. And, and I think you pretty much said it. You become your authentic self and you become a co-creator with others. Is there anything more you want to add to that? I think just the whole concept of joining genius is a very important one. I, I, I think 
that it's a process of co-creating. But joining genius and even higher in the frequency, fusing genius. If you find anyone, man or woman, whose genius brings forth yours when you join and you bring forth theirs, you're giving birth to the greater self. Mm -hmm. And I think that nature is creating the next stage after sex. And I call it supra-sex. Because sex is a very complex thing that you can get a, a, you know, a, a sperm and an egg and all these different types of configurations of sexuality that exist in this na- natural world. My God. <laughs> if, you ever, if you ever look at that, the, like fish and you know, all kinds of birds and all kinds of insects, amazing ways of reproducing themselves. Yes. No, okay. Not to mention just looking at the Kama Sutra. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And now we're not wanting to just reproduce ourselves. We're wanting to evolve ourselves. Mm -hmm. So from self-reproduction to self-evolution, the highest, one of the highest ways, if you do all your own inner work and all find your life purpose and you find others to join and fuse your unique genius with in, in love, it can be sexual or non-sexual. It really is the higher frequency is the genius joining. And if you can actually have sexuality and suprasexuality joining genius to give birth to the greater self, I think you've hit the high mark. Woohoo! Yeah, that's that's a, a, a tall order, but we're all capable of it. And and I know that when you were talking at Agape, you were talking about just exactly what you mentioned: moving from self-preservation and self-reproduction. Those were the two evolutionary yeah. urges. Up yes. until now. Yes, exactly. Self-preservation to, uh, you, to survive and then self-reproduction uh, to, to reproduce a species at, at, and which contributes to survival. And now uh, self-reproduction on, up to maximum could destroy life. Right. So the whole meaning of sexuality also changes to having chosen children and deeply joyful sexuality, but it's not at the same level that it was when it was for reproducing the species. Right. You know, that's where the church came in. That's where the sacred sex was, you know, in terms of reproduction is totally sacred. So then the evolution of sexuality, if it's not mainly for reproduction anymore, what, how do you evolve sexuality mm-hmm. as you evolve suprasexuality? Right, Where's well... It? question. Uh, it, it can be used by the local self purely for pleasure, for hedonism, yeah. or it can be used for self-evolution and co-creation to combine the two energies of the people merging together for yeah. a higher purpose. It can. And, and so there you're getting all this together. So sexuality, joining jo- for joining for the higher purpose of two people, then going all the way up to joining genius and feeling the vocational arousal and joy. I love that word, vocational arousal. Tell us about that. Well, vocational arousal is when you're with somebody who really loves your genius and you are attracted to theirs and you would like to get to know them better to join genius, you get your calling, your vocation gets aroused to join with this other person. And so you're always on the lookout for somebody who could be a partner in co-creating rather than in procreating. Very well put. I love that. I adore <laughs> that. And and I I have to I have to gloat a little bit. I feel like I have that with my husband. He he edits all my videos. He helps me out on the technological end. That's wonderful. That's he helps so- me to shine and and he's not interested in the spotlight. So yeah, we have, a, we have a really great partnership. I'm very, very happy with That's that. That's wonderful. Yes. So, so I'm wondering if you want to tell us about the concepts of telos and eros, <laughs> and why should that be important to us? Well, eros is love. And what we're really beginning to say is that love is at the core of evolution itself. That from the origin of creation through all the single cells and multi cells and animals and humans, and now you get, let's say, a Buddha, a Jesus, and now us, you can look at the whole trajectory as an evolution of love. Yes. 
And that that evolution of love is now activating love in us, getting over the shadow of separation as we are empathetic for the earth. We're empathetic for animals. We're empathetic for people who are in trouble, for starving children, for people in hurricanes and tornadoes in other parts of the world. This is one thing that the mass media really is doing. It's connecting us up so we're feeling the pain everywhere. And this is actually, uh, so the eros, the love, is, I think is, is really increasing into empathy. And then I've coined this word, telerotic, is eros with high purpose, because telos is high, high purpose. So if I am telerotic, telos and eros, because I am awakened in my love core of my being, in my love impulse to, to offer something creative in the world, I have a high purpose with my love. Mm. And I'm joining with others who have a high purpose with their love. So then you get into a wonderful level of joining genius to co-create at a small collective level. And that's when you, you I really think you're breaking through into new social forms altogether. Yes, yes. absolutely. I, I love that you said biologically we have evolved through love. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Umberto Maturana. He's a yes. biologist yeah, in Chile, and I loved reading his works, uh, that he said we could only evolve in a close society where everybody cared for each other very much. Those were the origins of yes. our impulses of today. And he's the one who came up with this theory that everything evolved through love. And, and I think that's really awakening everybody to realize that it's, it's not just survival of the fittest and competition. No, no, so we're changing our whole view on evolution, too, is evolution is always seeking more consciousness, yes, more yes. connectivity through allurement of separate parts. So it's a whole different view of, of evolution is coming out here. It's not God does it from the outside, and it's not accident and laws of nature. It's impulse of creation coming from inside. And I think it's from the conscious universe coming in to us as our own consciousness to evolve. Yeah, yeah. God, God creating from the inside out rather from the outside in. Yes. Yeah, and, and also Maturana says that our highest uh, capabilities as humans could not have, like for example, language and the ability to communicate with each other, that could not have evolved through competition or strife or violence, it had to evolve through cooperation. Right. So our, our highest possibilities are always evolved through cooperation, co-creation. Right. And, and of course, sexuality itself as an act of love, everybody is here because somebody had an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> so really, if you see people, throngs of people on a crowded street, you think, oh, everybody got here that way. I mean, really quite amazing. And what a joyful way to come into the world. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Good plan. So I'm, I'm making a, a, a suggestion to nature that as she got us to join genes because you, it's so pleasurable, joining genius is also very pleasurable. So we're going to get ever and ever more intelligent and more creative through joining genius rather than it's, it's more than just cooperating. You don't cooperate to have a baby. I mean, that, that wouldn't be the right word. So cooperate to do a project. Yes, you could do that. But to co-create, to join genius is juicy. It's telerotic. It's vocationally arousing. So you get turned on. <laughs> I love it. And we can, we can experience orgasms in many different parts of our body, not just in Orgas the second chakra. <laughs> Well, Barbara, you're getting me so excited here. <laughs> it has been really an uplifting and inspiring talk to talk to you. And I love getting inside your mind and hearing this beautiful vision and all of this consciousness and evolution coming through, through you as you are channeling the evolutionary impulse through you. And I wonder if you have any final parting words that we, you would like to leave for our viewers 
to help them to deal with the way that relationships are so difficult for people to hook up today, to help them, you know, navigate their their local self that keeps popping up or heal their shadows or anything else you might want to say? I, I really think the first step is your own wholeness. And so that you can really work through. And I highly recommend my book, Emergence, The Shift from Ego to Essence. And we're teaching that on the Shift Network. And when you become your own essence and you feel, fall in love with the inner divine that you are, then you're so much more tolerant of somebody else's local self. Mm-hmm. And if you can possibly get your partner to shift from ego to essence, too, so you become more of a, of, a, of a guide to the evolution of yourself and your partner so that the shadow becomes the impulse for self-evolution. That's really what it is. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So if you're experiencing your shadow self, it's an impulse for self-evolution. I love it. Yes. Beautiful way of putting it. Barbara, thank you so much for being with us. You're very welcome, and thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, and I have your uh, website URL right down here below the video. And then, Barbara, I just want to thank you again so much for being with us. You're absolutely welcome. (laughs) And bye-bye to everybody, and stay tuned again for another installment of Heal the Shadow in Your Relationships, too. Bye-bye.